today for this very timely discussion. In some ways, this Facebook Live session offers good news. A technology-based understanding of the viral structure of the novel coronavirus has actually accelerated vaccine design for COVID-19. We are all deeply affected by this pandemic, most of us working from home as one example. As you can perhaps tell from the background behind me, I'm working from home as well. I'm curious to know where you are watching from and what you came to learn. Please let us know in the comments. This is a discussion that I'm very encouraged by. We have with us today two people on the front lines of progress in developing a vaccine for the novel coronavirus. We will find out a little bit more today about when that vaccine might be available. The genome sequence of the coronavirus was published online in January of this year. My guests today were the ones who reported on how the virus gains entry to host cells using technology to really understand the structures at play. They published this work in a science paper on February 19th, just a month ago, and already the insights from that study are helping to inform vaccines. Earlier this week, as one example, the first phase one trial of an MNRA vaccine for COVID-19 began in Seattle, Washington. The Facebook Live today is really gonna focus on the vaccine and not on other aspects of the coronavirus discussion. The discussion will last about half an hour, and by the time it's over, you'll understand more about where we are in vaccine development for the novel coronavirus and about what factors got us here so quickly, including technology, past coronavirus research that started long before the pandemic, and a ready vaccine platform design. Let's get straight to our guests. Jason McClellan works at the University of Texas at Austin. His lab is focused on understanding and visualizing how hosts and pathogens interact, and he and his team use this information to develop vaccines and immunotherapies. Jason, thanks for being here today. Hi, Megan. Thanks so much for having me. Barney Graham is the Deputy Director and Chief of the Viral Pathogenesis Laboratory at the NIAID's Vaccine Research Center. He's the perfect person to be speaking here today amid the pandemic. He provides oversight of candidate vaccines in advanced development. Barney, thanks for being here today. Good morning, Megan. Thank you for having me. Jason, uh, to start today, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about the technology that you all use to better visualize the novel coronavirus and how that really set up those who would create the vaccine for success. Sure, Megan. So Barney and I have been working on coronaviruses since 2013. And in collaboration with Dr. Andrew Ward at the Scripps Research Institute, uh, we collectively were able to determine structures of spike proteins from uh, the HK1 coronavirus, MERS coronavirus, uh, my lab was then able to take that structural information and design mutations and constructs that help better stabilize the spike protein that's on the surface of the virus. And that ends up being a very good antigen because it looks like what's on the surface of the virus. We can train our bodies to recognize it. And a lot of that was, was done involving uh, cryo-electron microscopy, which has really been a major advance the last, uh, since 2012, 2013, really providing new ways to obtain structural information. Barney, we already have a vaccine candidate for the coronavirus in phase one clinical trials, in part thanks to the, the structure work that Jason described. Can you talk a little bit about how the efforts to create this vaccine compared to past efforts? How, how much faster are we moving here? Vaccine development is usually measured in decades. Even some of our most successful vaccines like human papillomavirus, HPV vaccine, the way to make that particle was discovered in the early 90s, but it didn't really become a vaccine for use until the mid to late 2000s. So the um, this work that Jason described and what we're talking about today harkens back to our work on RSV that occurred between 2010 and 2012. And uh, in that in that situation, we were able to stabilize, we were able to define the structure of the F glycoprotein, which is similar to spike on coronaviruses, and showed that stabilizing it in that pre-fusion confirmation uh, was, made it a better antigen, made it a better vaccine. It took about three years to turn that into a protein vaccine so that we could do a clinical trial, and we've now published that clinical trial, and it shows that it indeed is a good vaccine. 
when we uh, came to Zika in 2016, that was our previous fastest effort. And uh, it took about 200 days to go from starting the program to injecting uh, the first person. And in this case, uh, because we knew ahead of time what to do, we were able to get started within about 60 days after learning the sequence. So science published the paper that you all are referring to today uh, a month ago. It was a month ago yesterday. Um, in my work communicating research and particularly that research to press, I saw a, a, a massive reaction to it. Lots of reporters wanted to talk to you all. Can you tell us a little bit more about your lives since you published that paper, uh, what the scientific community's reaction to it has been and maybe new collaborations it's, it's generated uh, Jason, could you start for us? Sure. Uh, life has been super hectic uh, since the paper was published, but in a good way. Uh, we've gotten a lot of requests uh, initially for the, the coordinates, so for the, the digital representation of the structure itself. So we were emailing uh, 10, 20 people a day, the coordinates for different researchers around the world to do uh, virtual drug screening, uh, development in, uh, in silico of antibodies or, or new proteins that can bind. Uh, lately, we've just been constantly shipping the plasmid that we use to express the stabilized spike protein, and we've even been able to uh, ship some small amounts of the purified spike protein itself. So that's been really busy in the lab, and then just doing, I, don't know, I think I'm over 40 different interviews and, and articles and Q&As, and just trying to get uh, information out there to the public about what's going on, what we've done, and what the future looks like. Thanks, Jason. And Barney, how has it looked for you in the past 30 days? I think my timeline goes back to around June 6, when we heard it could be a coronavirus uh, coming out of China. And um, then we got the sequences on uh, the night of Ju January 10th. And since then, it's been 24-7 um, trying to make protein, uh, develop assays, start clinical trials do the animal studies to support the clinical trials and clinical development and communicating with a large number of people, uh, not just journalists, but coordination with, uh, with global organizations and U.S. government organizations. I wanted to talk uh, a minute, a little bit about the vaccine specifically that's in, in the clinical trial that started this week in Seattle. Uh, obviously there are several different types of vaccines, but the one that your research helped to support is an mRNA vaccine. Barney, could you explain to the audience what an mRNA vaccine is and, and what its benefits are? mRNA is messenger RNA. It's transcribed or copied from our from DNA, typically. This coronavirus has a genome that's made from RNA. And once we knew the sequence, uh, we, we could uh, make the protein we wanted stabilized in the way we wanted. And knowing the structure was uh, as we did, it told us that the protein was in the right conformation. That was in extremely helpful to push this forward because uh, we didn't have any antibody reagents to test the structure of the spike. We only knew it was right because of the structure. And so mRNA, uh, uh, then once that sequence gets into the hands of uh, a company, Moderna, who makes mRNA, uh, they designed their uh, product uh, so that when it's injected, it can go into a muscle cell and then inside that muscle cell, it will provide the code to make the protein, the spike protein, and that spike protein will go to the surface of the muscle cell, show itself to the immune system. Great. At this time, I, I wanna give a shout out to our viewers. We have a lot of people watching today from a lot of different places. And one of our viewers is actually watching from the International Space Station. I'm going to give a shout, shout out to James Bell, who's viewing today. Um, and remind the audience to please put your questions in the comments. We really want to get to them today. That's amazing. Hey, James. Yeah, you're probably the safest one on Earth. <laughs> He's not on Earth. <laughs> uh, and 
I want to talk a little bit about uh, other coronaviruses. We know that they're out there. Uh, MERS and, and SARS are some that viewers may be familiar with. Um, why, why haven't we tested a MERS vaccine in human trials? It's still circulating in the Middle East. It's still a problem there. Can you talk about that, Barney? Yes, um, that, that uh, experience we had with the Zika vaccine in 2016, we made a DNA vaccine for that because we could control it. But after that experience, we started working with Moderna and mRNA. And the purpose, in fact, was to develop a MERS vaccine. And we did make a MERS spike vaccine with mRNA and shown, have shown that it's working in mice, at least. There was never enough uh, impetus behind that to take it into uh, GMP manufacturing so we could actually give it to people. Um, it's very hard to, to uh, invest that type of resources uh, when it's a regional problem. MERS is a problem mostly now in the Middle East. It doesn't spread that easily. And so for regional diseases, it's been hard to convince people how important it is to solve those problems. Are there any corollaries with, with SARS where we, we don't have a vaccine either eight years after that outbreak? Uh, why do we think we'll be more successful with a vaccine for the novel coronavirus? Well, now we have a structure. And uh, after SARS, we, we really didn't know what we were doing, uh, making vaccine antigens uh, blindly. And after MERS happened, we made a decision based on our RSV experience that Jason and I and Peter Kwong uh, worked on in those early 2010s. And uh, we made a decision that if we ever have to face this again, we need to know what we're doing. So we started solving structures and found ways to solve them. Some, you know, had a number of serendipitous uh, steps along the way, but uh, the structures got solved. We know a lot about the spike protein now and a lot about how antibodies neutralize the coronavirus. In, ter in terms of structures and the importance of being able to study them, uh, Jason, how, how um, important is it that young people get involved in, in the work that you're doing? I mean, are there a lot of people already doing this or would you put out a call to action for more scientists to be focused on you know, real structural investigation to inform therapies? Oh, there's a lot of structural biologists out there. Uh, we can certainly use more. The field's expanding as new technologies grow, such as cryoelectron microscopy. Uh, they allow us to truly really make these uh, beautiful structures. So this is the coronavirus spike protein. And so we'll, we have this map. We know where all the residues are. And then we can start to design in specific mutations to improve the stability of the protein, to boost expression levels. Uh, we can truncate regions that we think aren't going to elicit a robust immune response. And so having these maps allows for a real rational engineering approach. And I think the, the field of uh, structural vaccinology is, is really blooming and a lot of new people are entering. It's nice and, to see that structure. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And Jason, that's, that model you have, the 3D print, uh, is about 10 million times larger than the actual protein. It's amazing to be able to understand that level of detail. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when you're looking at uh, structures through cryo-EM, what are some of the biggest surprises that you, you find, Jason? What, what does the technology really let you see that, that has surprised you? Uh, one of the things that cryo-EM has allowed us to visualize are some of the dynamics of the, of the spike protein. Uh, so perhaps other techniques like X-ray crystallography uh, we might end up trapping the molecule in one conformation within the crystal lattice. Whereas with cryo-EM, we're looking at individual single particles and then uh, classifying them into different groups that maybe have different conformations or motions. And, and we saw that with the, with the spike protein, there's actually one of these domains that can move up and down. And we can see that type of motion via cryo-EM. And that ends up being very important to the coronavirus entry. The spike has three receptor binding domains and it sort of hides them away from the immune system and then occasionally will uh, flick them up in order to bind the receptor. And those dynamics are important. We think that once all three receptor binding domains become bound to a receptor, that triggers the conformational rearrangement that leads to fusion of the viral membrane with the host cell membrane, which then causes the cell to become infected. I now wanna to go to an audience question from Michelo Brito Gonzalez. 
And the question is, so far, are there any known side effects from this mRNA-based vaccine? We know that the trials have just started. Uh, maybe this is an opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, the mouse work that's also been done on this vaccine. There's been several mRNA vaccines taken into clinical trials by uh, multiple different companies. And uh, there's not been a lot of local or systemic side effects from those vaccines. Uh, Moderna uh, has done uh, seven or eight clinical trials with their vaccine products against infectious diseases. And it was on the basis of that safety data that from their prior trials that we were able to start the phase one trial as quickly as we did. And what about when these vaccines are tested in, in animals? Uh, do the animals respond to, to the novel coronavirus, mice in particular, in the same way that humans do? Uh, because we were able to make the protein so quickly, uh, we've started um, experiments both with protein spike and mRNA expressed spike. So the protein we make in the lab, the protein from the mRNA the mice make in their muscle cells. And uh, we've already gone through about six weeks of that, those experiments. And we know that the mice are making antibody responses even after the first dose and much higher antibody responses after the second dose. There's no evidence of any kind of uh, illness or disease or side effects in the mice that we've been able to see so far. Okay. Okay. We're we have a lot of questions coming in from viewers. So I'm gonna move to, to the next one now. This is from Kathleen Jones. She's a high school science teacher. And she asks, what resources can I provide to my students to expose them to this information, including the structural information uh, that they can understand? So some lay language resources, both on the importance of understanding viral structure and how that can inform vaccine development. Jason, maybe we can start with you. Sure. Uh, a number of companies are creating some pretty cool resources, imagery, videos on my uh, Twitter account. I posted a really cool molecular animation that Alara Systems made uh, using some of the models of the spike and really beautiful renderings and how it interacts with host cell receptors. So I think we're seeing a lot more of a development of, of those types of imageries for the general public. The coordinates themselves of the structure are deposited at the protein data bank www.rcsb.org. People can download the coordinates, visualize them using uh, software such as PyMall and others, and really start to spin it around, look at it, uh, much like I was doing with the 3D print. They can look at that on their laptops, uh, even on their phone, uh, they, can, they can do some of that. And feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, I can try to put some of that information out there. And I've worked with high school students before who use 3D printers and that information Jason explained to make their own 3D models of the F protein that we did back and published in 2013. So I think there's ways for high school students either through uh, software or through 3D printing to, to really start getting into how structural biology and, and viral molecules are put together. Barney, I think it's just me and you. We lost Megan. Okay. Well. I have a question for you, Barney. Okay. What are the next steps? How long does the phase one clinical trial last and when would a phase two be started? Uh, the phase one has already started. We, we enrolled four people on Monday and four people on Tuesday of this week. And um, you know we'll be getting samples from them over the coming weeks and uh, we'll use that information plus the information from uh, animal studies we do both in small animals like mice or larger animals like non-human primates and then uh, try to advance this if we see no uh, evidence of harm uh, and we do see evidence that it could work we would advance it to what's called a phase two trial, which would be several hundred people instead of 45 people who are in this early trial. And at the same time, all these things are being done in parallel. The manufacturing process is being scaled up. 
the regulatory documents are being uh, uh, developed, the clinical protocols are being developed, and the animal models are all going on in parallel. So that the hope, if everything goes smoothly, we could be in a larger scale trial with thousands of people by uh, before next winter in the Northern Hemisphere. If, if that can happen, then we would have a chance of learning whether this vaccine works or not in, uh, in just within that one year period. And that would give not only uh, this vaccine confidence, but it would give confidence to other vaccine modalities that are being developed move forward and scale up in a more rapid way so that, um, you know, maybe by uh, a year or a year and a half from now, we would be able to have uh, vaccines more available for the general public. And, and like I said, vaccine development is usually a decades long process. So um, this would be if everything goes uh, completely smoothly over the next uh, year to year and a half. That's great. Welcome back, Megan. Thanks, guys. Thanks for keeping it going. <laughs> a day in the life of technology. But we have another question, and I think this viewer is wanting to understand the importance of your research as it informs the basic science efforts in the country. Ryan Gray is asking if you could tell us how much a cryo EM scope costs and give us an estimate of how much scope time um, and cost of time it took to get to the structure. Could you talk about that, Jason? Yeah, the electron microscopes are pretty expensive in the millions of dollars, depending on which model. Uh, then you need to have a facility sort of designed around them with the proper infrastructure. They generate terabytes of data uh, per day. So then we need a lot of computational resources, which is something I'm constantly meeting with uh, folks here at UT to how to handle terabytes of data, how to maintain them, what to do with waste, how to archive it, to preserve it. Uh, then we have facility managers. These are highly qualified uh, people with PhDs in order to keep the microscopes aligned and running and help troubleshoot, train new users. So the initial investment is in the five to $10 million range. And then we're looking at around maybe four to $500,000 per year in maintenance, service contracts, salaries. Uh, so it, it really adds up and uh, it can get quite expensive. So we do need a lot of support there, but the facilities at UT have been fantastic. Another question from a viewer on a different topic. Um, Janet Fox asks, what exactly is it that causes even healthy people to succumb to COVID-19? Is it only immunosuppression? Uh, that's a very good question. And we're just learning about uh, this particular virus, but in other respiratory viruses that we understand better, uh, this is basically a race between the virus growth in your lung and the T cell or immune responses responding to that virus growth. And you know, if the T cells get there a day earlier, you may uh, not have much disease. If the T cells get there a day later, uh, you may have a lot of disease. And so. This is, uh, this is one of the reasons and basis for vaccination. We want to educate your immune responses to be there a day or two earlier than they would be ordinarily. And that is what allows you to clear the virus before it causes much damage. Then we have a comment from a student in a lab who's analyzing this, actually a professor who's analyzing your paper together with his students, CJ Wolfslager at the University in Delft. He asks, uh, any knowledge if the coronavirus undergoes antigenic shift or drift similar to influenza? Yeah, Barney, you want to take this one? Well, it, it evolves. Uh, it's not going to evolve quite as fast as uh, influenza does. Um, another coronavirus researcher, Mark Dennison at Vanderbilt University, showed that coronaviruses actually have an editing function. It's the first RNA virus uh, found to have editing function within their uh, uh, polymerase that makes or copies the RNA. So it doesn't make as many mistakes as other RNA viruses like the ones we studied before, like RSV or, or even influenza. So it's going to drift and it's going to uh, be different, but uh, 
and there's going to be new coronaviruses that come that would be slightly different. So we'll have to figure out how to make more generalizable approaches to, to coronavirus uh, vaccinology. Barney, it looks like we're getting a lot of questions about mutations and whether as the virus continues to spread in humans, whether the vaccine would remain efficacious. Any thoughts on that, given the, the rate of mutations we've observed so far in genome sequences? Uh, well, you know, uh, it's we don't know enough uh, to say this for sure yet, but um, we do know that even some of the proteins that we've made based on the original SARS-1 protein or some SARS-like viruses that are can be found in bats, we know that we can generate immune responses that at least partially cross-react with this new uh, coronavirus. Now, the individual antibodies are not quite as potent as they are to the original SARS in terms of blocking their entry, but I think there's ways that we can design uh, vaccine or viral proteins to, to have a breadth that would at least within the clay B of beta coronaviruses protect us against that group of viruses. So the question is, can we find approaches that could uh, allow us to have uh, products for clay C, for clay A, for alpha coronaviruses? And I think those kinds of studies can be done uh, using structure guided design. Barney, Jason, we have a comment from a student at the Simons Electron Microscopy Center in New York City. Oh, cool. she, she wanted to know, this is Laura Yanni Yen, that they're doing a journal club on your paper next week. So yet another group who will be uh, studying your work. Awesome, I hope, I hope you like it. I think a lot in the a lot of people in the audience may be interested as I am, I have young children, to know a little bit more about, you know, the future of this vaccine. Uh, it's only being tested in adults now, but when it would be tested in, in younger people, um, what do you anticipate at that time? Uh, the first trials are in people between 18 and 55 years of age who are relatively healthy, but uh, very quickly, as long as things look like the vaccine is working, that it's safe, we'll expand those trials to older people and to younger people. The experiments in younger animals and older animals has already uh, begun. And uh, that the expectation would be that we would, would move uh, those studies into younger and older people. And now a question from Abbas Baca. Would this accelerated pace of vaccine development and approval set a precedent for future vaccines of the same type, but using different mRNA sequences? Yeah, I, th I think that's true. Barney, I'll just jump in there for a second. I think the idea for some of these uh, nucleic acid-based vaccines is to develop a platform. And once the platform is developed and, and many of the kinks are worked out in terms of delivery and stability, then it becomes relatively easy to pop in and out the open reading frames and coding for the antigen. One of the things that we're uh, trying to accomplish here in a more generalized way is that um, we think to deal with future problems or even current problems that are not solved yet, uh, unmet needs, that you have to con combine precision vaccinology with rapid platform manufacturing. So. If you have structures, if you know exactly uh, how to make the vaccine antigen that we call an immunogen, and then you have a vaccine platform that, for manufacturing that can allow you to make it rapidly and deliver it in a way that uh, can work, then combining those two concepts, we think, uh, could be a way forward for uh, future problems like this. Jason Barney, uh, Jenny Brennan is asking, what has been the role of veterinary research in assisting with the development of this vaccine? Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, uh, almost everything we do is preceded by uh, uh, doing animal modeling. So in, in the sense that uh, we have veterinarians working side by side with us, some of our lab people are veterinarians uh, who've gotten also PhDs. And, uh, you know, veterinary medicine is very important here. Um, there's also a lot of 
uh, veterinary coronaviruses that cause widespread uh, economic problems, especially in pigs. And so I think the solutions that we're finding here uh, could be relevant to the solutions for veterinary problems. And we're living in a one health world now. That, that means human health, animal health, and ecological health are all working together. And we, we need to solve all that at the same time. So I see that we've reached at 9.30. I, I wanna ask you both a question, uh, a question we could ask anybody watching today and it may be a different facet, but how has the need for social distancing as we're all trying to do that as much as we can affected you both in the work that you are continuing to do at your labs and, and elsewhere? Can, can we start with you, Barney? Well, you see, I'm working from home uh, today, but um, our, our biggest concern is that uh, uh, the people in our lab group, uh, who are mostly young people, uh, can keep coming to work without either being infected or quarantined. And so uh, figuring out that, figuring out the supply chain for our development work and assay development, uh, those kind of things are, are different than what we usually have to face in, in uh, processes like this. How about you, Jason? Uh, it's actually been pretty good. Uh, traffic's low, parking's really easy. <laughs> Uh, our lab is uh, exempt from some of the shutdowns, so uh, we're just here. Um, lab is mostly made up of grad students and postdocs who are young, uh, so everybody's been continuing to come in. Uh, getting to FedEx and shipping things has been a little tricky, uh, so we're, we're driving to and from FedEx facilities to pick up and ship packages. Uh, but yeah, otherwise we're just moving forward. Well, thank you both for all that you're doing to continue to move forward now. Um, we want to start to, to wrap up our event today. Uh, Jason, do you have any last remarks, anything that you want to leave the audience with? Yeah, but we're going to get through this. We have a, a lot of people around the world working on, on interventions. The social distancing is definitely going to help. Uh, we'll have uh, numerous vaccines being tested, uh, antibodies isolated, small molecules in clinical trials. I think we're we're well prepared. Uh, we've been working on coronaviruses for a long time. That the global we, the scientific community, uh, so just hang in there, keep practicing social distancing, and we'll get through it. Thanks, Jason. Barney. I'd like to just make two brief points. One is the importance of basic research in supporting our ability to respond to problems like this. This all started with just the simple uh, desire to want to know the structure of the prefusion F protein of RSV. And that led to epitope discovery and uh, a vaccine development that looks like it's uh, progressing through into de advanced development. And that is the basis for this concept used here of stabilizing the spike glycoprotein. So one thing is the importance of uh, basic research. The other um, related to investment, I think we need to invest in basic research. We need to specifically invest in things that can help us be better prepared. There are technologies now really developed over the last 10 years that make it possible for us to have uh, prototype approaches for each virus family or genera that would allow us to not only uh, be better prepared, but to respond faster. We responded very quickly to this because we'd been studying coronaviruses for seven years and we already knew which, what mutations to make to stabilize the protein. If this had been a, an arena virus or a bunya virus or some things that are less well studied, uh, we would have taken uh, a few years probably to even get in phase one. So I think there needs to be investment in pandemic preparedness and there needs to be investment in recognition that this all started from basic research. Thank you, Barney. Yes, the, the situation absolutely underscores the importance of basic research. This is a message that we try to communicate the importance of that from AAAS and science as well. Uh, Thank you so much to both of our guests today. We learned about where we are in vaccine development for the novel coronavirus, how that compares to va past vaccine development, 
And as Barney was just alluding to, how basic research helped us get here so quickly for COVID-19 to phase one trials already, at least for one candidate. Uh, you can find a link to the paper that we referenced um, in our science Facebook Live discussion comments. I wish everyone watching safety and health in days ahead. Be well. Bye for now.